Keith, great to finally get here at Real Vision. We've had so many people trying to introduce us, get us together, and I've always been following, well, I followed you for a long time on Twitter and other things, and thinking, you know, this is a guy we need to get on Real Vision. So finally, thank you for coming to join us. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me and for making it, for making it work. Your studio is far nicer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So look, tell people a little bit about the background of what you do now, and then more importantly, how you came into the business and a little bit of your story. Yeah, so now I have a company called Hedgeye that's 10 years old. But I started as uh, any other analyst on Wall Street, got a job as a hedge fund analyst, didn't know what I was doing, started to figure that out a little bit. Uh, worked with a guy named John Dawson uh, as he was breaking up with a guy named Art Sandberg, if you oh, yeah, probably yeah, recall yeah. Uh, Pequot Capital. Yeah, and Art's been on Real Vision. Yeah, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And um, so we, we were right there on Pequot Avenue, that's why it's called Pequot, yeah. in Southport, Connecticut. And I you know, cut my chops as a buy side analyst, then they gave me my own book probably too early. Uh, <laughs> back then we didn't have factor exposures or limits which, or hedges. Which year was this? Uh, this is back in, two th well I started as an analyst back in 2000. Right, okay. Yeah, graduated from college in 99. As a Canadian you're about 35 years old at that, at that point. So, <laughs> you're, uh, so then I rolled into you know, uh, you know, your traditional Wall Street investment banking program. Couldn't stand that after a year and went to the buy side. And then eventually became a portfolio manager, had my own fund and uh, And you were it. running tech? Tech portfolio or? Um, consumer, uh, consumer, global consumer okay, right. with a big, um, and that's kind of how I got into global macro was I got tired of modeling companies that couldn't tell me what the forward outlook was from a macro perspective, because that's of course what they would always get wrong. So I would get wrong and I didn't like being wrong. So I started to build uh, a global macro overlay to actually analyzing companies from a bottom up perspective, which was easier with global companies like Nike, for example, or some of the big ones that I started to understand better earlier, uh, but it all started with just being an analyst. You know, I started as an analyst. And now today, like as a, I guess I've, uh, I, I moonlight as a macro strategist, but most of my, all my macro calls are born out of that same analytical process. And that's 20 years, we're almost 20 years later, uh, but I've really just kind of applied most of my fundamental learnings as a bottom up analyst to my top down view. And that's not, it's certainly not a qualitative one, it's how I quantify it, like this whole, rate of change process that we built and whatnot. But so that process of bottoms, bottoms up and top down was kind of the tiger management approach. People like that, some people have done it really well mm -hmm. because there's a lot of top down information in the granular data in the bottoms up stuff, if, mm -hmm. you, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so is that what you did? You, you kind of try to marry the two together? Yeah, I mean, in, in the beginning, I, I, again, you, you always start with you don't know what you're doing when you're trying to refine you know, a, a better path of getting it more accurate more often. And I just fundamentally couldn't understand why people weren't applying like a process, a repeatable process from a macro perspective to signal what is the dollar impact going to be, again, to use the example, what is the dollar impact going to be on Nike's quarter? What is the global growth rate decelerating going to do to Nike's European business? You know, so that's, you know, it, it was just a logical conclusion that you should get to having a rate of change macro process as an overlay to bottom up companies. Then I started working with many more bottom up analysts. I let them do that because that's a full time job. I mean, there's yeah. plenty of hedge funds today that believe that's all you have to do. And um, yeah, it's been a great learning experience starting to see what everybody else does, like being in the other team's dressing room, so to speak, because now I'm the sell side guy or uh, whatever you want to call me. And I get to learn what they're doing and try to help them augment you know, their process with mine. And it's been a great voyage in that regard. You, you learn so much faster when you see what other people are doing and you can back test it. And because my goal, of course, is to be right. And I'm, yeah. I have no problem boring, you know, other people's best practices. There's plenty of them out there. Yeah. So one of the things I mean, I found that was my epiphany moment was back in the late 90s, where I suddenly realized if you look at the chart of G GDP, it goes up and down. Mm -hmm. It's cyclical. And when you look at every single analyst, they assume linear demand, let's call it. Mm -hmm. So in which case they don't ever look at the macro is how will the global demand situation driven by the business cycle change the performance of Nike mm -hmm. or the dollar or interest rates that companies borrow or anything. And I had the same epiphany. It's like, really? I mean, this is really 80% of all returns come out of macro. Yeah, particularly at the turns. I mean, yeah, at know, the so, turns especially. So I like to like, just think of it as one, you know, one gigantic sine curve that can have the amplitude and longevity of anything. There's no fixed point. Correct. But people who are modeling things bottom up don't quite like that. They want it to be linear. Um, so that's the opportunity is really in understanding and having, I like to think that if you have an apolitical and data-driven view, 
you can really be data dependent. You know, the answer is staring you right there in the face. And a lot of people, when they do macro, they do it one of, well, they're one of many ways now. Obviously, there are many different strategies. But the big difference I see is people, a lot of people say, this is what the data should look like or could look like, or the outlook could or should look like. Whereas we've built a, you know, plenty of mathematical tools that are more modern uh, than anything you, know, you might have seen before in terms of macro uh, hedge fund managers and whatnot, predictive tracking algorithms. You can know day to day. It's not, it's not a guess anymore. You can mm -hmm. now cast uh, what the market is telling you about what is right there. So trade what's in front of you as opposed to what you might ordinarily want to see. And I think that was a great learning. I mean, as opposed to certainly trying to tell the macro market what to do, just listen to it. And, and again, uh, a lot of people do try yeah. and tell it what to do. Yeah. It's, like it's not doing the right thing. It's like, yeah. well, maybe either you're too early or wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've, I think most of what I do is a function of my, all my mistakes. I mean, I've tried. Uh, Anybody tried a lot who of says things. you can't approach this business without humility. Mm -hmm. Because I always say every time you think your shit smells of roses, you're going to get your face rubbed <laughs> in it. And it's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely true. You know, it is all about failing. I mean, yeah. people, anybody who doesn't understand that failure, Repeated failure, but losing less than you make in the upside is the whole investing game. Mm -hmm. And learning from why you're failing is is the icing on the cake. So once you started figuring this out, what made you leave kind of traditional Wall Street and set up your own shop? How did the, talk me through that whole process? Well, first I got fired. I mean, that's the best way to start. <laughs> okay, that's a good uh, way. To so start. you start from a real safe place of not being able to go back and do your job. Yeah, uh, I was at Carlisle, so I, as I walked through it briefly. I mean, I, ha I had my own hedge fund probably at too early of an age. I uh, effectively went to Magnetar Capital and rolled that into a big book there and started to learn, oh, what are these factor exposures? I mean, Magnetar had this you know, proprietary system that was very early in its days, and I, and I give them a lot of credit for that. And I had no idea what it was that they were doing until I finally lived inside of that. Carlisle asked me to come basically run long, short for them. That imploded within what well, was the fastest loss of capital, certainly, that I've ever seen. Um, we completely blew up you know, Carlisle's uh, initial hedge fund. And it wasn't me. Our credit team lost a, a, a significant amount of capital in a short period of time. So effectively- Was that with Ralph Reynolds and Rick Goldsmith? Yeah, that was. Because yeah. they were my old bosses from years ago. Oh, they were. Yeah. yeah and West. and I, so I was with them for a very brief period of time. It's, right. it's kind of a classic, like you said, you think it smell like roses. When I got hired by Carlisle, I thought this is the best job possible. You're, you're a young partner managing whatever director title at one of the biggest private equity firms on earth that's going to fund their first hedge fund. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. And then six months later, I'm carrying a box with my, <laughs> uh, with my notebooks. Yeah. And um, my son's going to be born the week after that, my first son. Um, so it was a pretty jarring experience. I mean, I really, the num number one reason why I started my own firm is that I had a non-compete, uh, so I couldn't go back. And the second reason is that after a couple of weeks, I was like, I kind of like not working for anybody but myself. And that's when I started to think through, okay, what is it that I could do that could actually change the world a little bit more than me just having another big P&L? What year was this? This was in 2000, late 2007. Right. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a, an explicit market view that was much different than Wall Street's. And that, that was the beginning of you know, making a, an early and big bear market call to start. That's effectively what I started the firm with, hmm. was, was a call that people would, would be paying attention to, not for the sake of making the call. It was the same process I'd used for the first part of my career and what I was seeing at that point in my career. So I saw a big opportunity in being in print, or as I like to say, time stamped with accountability using modern, um, you know, modern technologies. And don't forget, a lot of the things that came to be over that period of time were new. I used to call it YouTubing the street or you know, tweeting obviously was shortly thereafter. There are so many ways to communicate why things were happening a certain way, why other people were saying, that's not happening, this can't be happening, this should not be happening. All the way down obviously to Warren Buffett in October of 2008.